Hello and welcome to this week's Super Six podcast with myself, Laura Woods and Bio Akin Benoit. It's good to be back, Bio. How are you doing? Not too bad, not too bad. Just finished training, so now nah, just trying to relax and that. Um, but I'm good. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Talking about it's good to be back. I saw you back on the bench. Yeah, so is the body yeah, all yeah. right? Is it holding up? Is it yeah, nice to be back you know involved? What? It's holding up. Um, I trained two days last week, so that got me on the, in the match day squad for the Norwich game. Um, boys done well, man. We took a it's good Norwich team and just two quality moments, I guess, from Norwich. But no, it's nice to be back. I trained again today, so hopefully I'm in the match day squad for Watford tomorrow. So yeah, man. No, man, it's it's good, man. It's good. It's good. It's good out there, man. And the sun's coming out. So it's it's less retirement weather. Doesn't it just make everything feel better? Like literally, like I opened the door this morning and I was like, ah, oh, this is this is the kind of place that I want to live at the moment. Uh, listen, Whereas before I, and it was cold and miserable. I was like, ah, oh, this is crap. Do you know what? And look, all this is, of course, because of course you know you don't know I've got knee problems and that and I've got arthritis mm-hmm. in my knee and I won't lie to anybody. Like when it's cold, it's a struggle. And it's just, I won't, you know, we laugh and joke, but when it's cold, it's a struggle. So the last week, like the sun's been out and I'm out there and I'm like, you know what? This is not, I ain't got to tackle the elements, if you know what I'm saying. So I'm, I'm enjoying being back out there in training. So fingers crossed that I can stay fit to the end of the season. Yeah, I understand what you're saying about arthritis in the knee and about how the weather sort of changes it because I did speak to my nan last week and she was like, it's cold at the moment and she has the same problems as you. Yeah, and old people problems, you get what I'm saying? <laughs> I may be young, Sorry, that was so rude. But, but I've got I've got I've got I've got a knee of an old person. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. It's my weeks, but I think that's so well. <laughs> It's okay. <laughs> enough about me about that. Don't worry. I'm gonna put that in my pocket until later. Um, enough about me. How you been? What you been up to? I've been good. Today is actually a good day because um, this morning we had Gareth Southgate on Talksport Breakfast for an hour, yeah. and um, oh, honestly, you know, like one of those times where you're really starstruck before he's even arrived. And like we're doing, he comes up on Zoom. So he actually arrived on Zoom 10 minutes early, very prompt, just as you'd expect. Oh, good guy, and uh, good so guy. he was sat there watching, just watching and, and kind of waiting to, to enter the conversation. So I'm like, oh, like thinking, don't stumble your words, don't say anything bad. And like a couple of sections earlier, maybe like an hour or two earlier, I was telling the nation, I was like, right, Gareth Southgate's coming up. And I described him as the waste guy. I said, like, oh, you did? The, waist, the waistcoat. I, I don't know why I said it. I just said the waistcoat himself is coming up on Talksport Breakfast. And it was like, what? Why have you just called him the waistcoat? And Ali McCoy was like, the waistcoat? <laughs> <laughs> like, Darren, Darren Bent was in there and he made this noise like, what? I was you like, no, oh, there was a waistcoat man, yeah? The waistcoat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the yeah. Listen, we got the, the building. Say nothing. How is he, though? How is he? I mean, to be fair, I've met okay. Gal Southgate. He's a cool, proper, proper cool. Like, but how was he taught to me? me? Oh, he's like mega chilled. Like, just a really nice, um, like a really nice vibe about him. Yeah. And you have to be respectful of those kind of questions, don't you? Because even though you want to be probing, he's the England manager and he's not going to tell you his tactics. He's not going to tell you his selection, anything like that. So, you know, you kind of ask him a lot of questions around the topic. We took him back to Euro 96 because Ali McCoist was there as well. So it was like kind of memories. And it was funny, actually, because he was talking about that game, England, Scotland, the dentist chair celebration, um, Gaza. I was like, who came up with the idea? Like, And he was like, well, well, obviously it was Gaza, you know, none of the rest yeah. of us were going to do it. And he, what he said about it was how incredible it was that moment that he remembered to even do that celebration after yeah. scoring a wonder goal yeah, like he did yeah. in the circumstances that he did. To even remember to go, oh, that celebration that we wanted to do, to go and do it, it must have just been in like the front of his mind. Um, but he was great. He was bantering Ali. He was saying, you know, the best part of that game was when Ali came off the bench and that completely swayed it in our direction. And it was just, it was uh, funny. Yeah, like, he's, he's got it, a it good was, energy. It was a pinch yourself it? moment. He's, he's got, got a, a real, great energy. Yeah, yeah, he's got a real good energy. And that's why, uh, yeah. you know, we talked about him earlier when he was getting stick. And I like I like what he's done, man. I think he's bridged the gap between, you know, they had this whole mindset of England being uh, prestigious and, you know, yeah. and I just felt he's just literally has bridged the gap that, look, footballers, and they, even though it's England and they're the elite, they're still just human beings. And that's what I liked. And not like I want to drop in, but we kicked it together at the Super Bowl in Miami. You know, like, we cool like that, me and Gal we, we cool like that. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, man, we, we're cool. What's it like when you're, like, hanging out together? 
No, to be fair, said, we didn't hang out. Wearing a waistcoat. Nah, no, nah, he was chilled, man. He had a little blazer on, and uh, to be fair, it was hot in Miami, so no, nah, he was cooling down. But when I see him and like we caught eyes and that, and he was like big man, and uh, for me, Did I'm like, yo, that? do you know that's the craziest thing? And I've got it on video and that. It's like big man, and then he embraced and we embraced. I was like, yo, this is the England manager out right here, bruv. He'd be chatting to Kane and Sancho, and and he'd be like big man. I was like, yo, but no, he was just cool. He was proper. He was like, look, you out here, you enjoying yourself. I was like, yeah, because you enjoying yourself. He's like, yeah, yeah. Because well, listen, the Black Eyed Bees were on, and he liked that. Um, so he went to go what finish watching them, and then I went on and you know done some more filming and that. But no, nah, man, he's a cool, a cool guy, man. So no, nah, but success for him still. That's such a good story. That's a, a much better story than any of my Gareth Southgate stories. Honestly, like all nah, of my. Man, you like, called him a waistcoat man. What the hell? Come on, that's the elite story, <laughs> Nick. You ain't gonna call him out a waistcoat man, but I can't top that. <laughs> Honestly, that sums me up. It absolutely sums me up. The fact that I've got like word vomit. You know when those things like used to say like when you're younger, like whatever you do, don't say this when you meet yeah. someone. And it's always the first thing I'll say because nerves just get the better. As if I'm a presenter, do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, Them ones the there, you know. The first I, thing I say is the I, thing I, I shouldn't I, say. I, I don't even know how you even that because I know he's synonymous with the word synonymous. You see how I dropped that bar there? <laughs> Whoa! I mean, the wrong, the wrong uh, letters, but don't worry about it. <laughs> no, it'd be easy, man. What I'm with you, man. It just sounded, it flowed out my tongue out there, you know, but he's synonymous with the um, the waistcoat, <laughs> innit? So, you know them ones there. Do you know what the greatest story, the greatest story of of the World Cup was that waistcoat sales soared by... That is crazy. That is crazy. (laughs) Amazing, isn't it? You need to do a collaboration. Um, This isn't just a waistcoat. This is a Gareth Southgate waistcoat. That's how you've got to do it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I definitely would have jumped on that. I'll tell you that now, yeah. Jeez. Right, you pitch it. I'll do the voiceover for it. We'll go to m and and we'll say, look, just ahead of the Euros, you might want to consider this a collaboration. We'll make it, we'll package it up for them. It'd be great. Come on, man. And we take 28% each. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't leave <laughs> much for Bell and for Gareth Southgate. Oh, he'll be doing all right. Um, okay, fine. So this week's guest, um, I'm excited about this one. Um, it is another Leeds player. And I tell you what, we get a lot of traction when we speak to Leeds players, don't we? Yeah, 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 yeah. Because, you know, Leeds are forced to be reckoned with, you know what I'm saying? Like, so, and I'm looking forward to this as well, because I want to know a bit, a, a bit more about this, this individual. So I'm looking forward to this. Excellent. Okay, let's go meet him. So, uh, very excited to say this week's guest is Leeds' very own Stuart Dallas. Hello, Stuart. Hey, guys, you okay? Yeah, okay. what's going on, Stuart? You good? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Just waiting for you guys. Um, sorry. <laughs> yeah, oh, well, so I, I, I'm sorry, we? brother. Like, this, like we said, I've already said this off air. I'm going to say it again. Don't you look like he's about to perform? Hey, bro, he looks yeah. suave and sharp. Come on, oh. G. I've got, I've got a scene. I've, you might not like this, Stuart. I've got a scene that the listeners can kind of picture so that they understand what you look like. You know when Westlife wear all black and they're yes. on the edge of the kind of seats and then they yes. and they stand up and they, you uh, raise me. That's what, it's, I'm sort of getting Westlife vibes. I'm no, sorry, it's Pat. Just a it's, it's Is it just a hoodie? Is it that's just a hoodie? All, all it's, just, it's the way you put it together. I'm not going to lie. It's just the way you put it together. You just, you look like, oh, I see. I've just yeah, been like, out there and... I've just been out playing with the kids in the garden, so... Uh, so you just like look like that. You just hands. wake up looking like that, yeah? It's all right, brother. It's cool. No. We ain't all as lucky <laughs> as you, brother. <laughs> no. You put us to shame, to be fair. Anyway, right. Jeez. That's that's the welcome that you get. Um, how are you, Stuart? How are things? Things are good, yeah. Uh, can't complain. And uh, nobody, nobody will listen to me if I do complain, so... I just get on with it. So Do you know what? I was, I was going to save this until the end, but as you said that, I, oh, I feel like yeah. I need to bring it to the start because someone has texted me saying, um, good luck with Stuart today, great guy, the biggest moaner in the team. <laughs> oh, it's true. Oh, yeah, because, hey, they, they, go on, tell us. No, because Calvin Phillips done a thing with Soccer AM before, I think, and he, and he mentioned me for being the biggest moaner, but I don't know where he gets that from, honestly. Yeah. So you're like not I, a moan. Yeah, you know how it is. I, I like to complain an odd time, but what, I do what are you moaning work, about? You know? Yeah, yeah. What, 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 what is the biggest pet peeve? Talk to me. So, what is it? What my one is? You better hit to my feet because I'm not running. So, <laughs> well, that's my thing, isn't it? So I'll be shouting, breathing. <gasps> yeah, you see me just running. Yeah. Yeah, that's my one. Yeah. So, what's your biggest one where it just you just lose your head? No, I, I don't. Mo- I don't really moan on the pitch. I think what Kelvin's getting at is is just when when the the 
the programs come through and and the timings of of to do stuff and I just always I just like having a moan and just but nothing <laughs> nothing major I always I, I do the work and I get I get it done and uh, yeah it's, I'm I'm disappointed in Cal that he's that he's called me that. <laughs> well, I promise you, Carolyn isn't the one that, that dubbed you in to me. And I actually hadn't watched that episode of Soccer AM. So, so this is from yeah. a completely separate source. So that's two people saying, it, I'm just saying. But oh, like, no. we, I tell you what, though, we did have Liam Cooper on. I'm not saying that's the person either because it's not him too. But one thing that he did say was we were talking about training and about Marcelo Bielsa's training, especially during lockdown and what he had you guys doing. So that when you came back for the, the second part of the season, when it all started up again, you'd, you'd been like running around fields and, and on the ground and like up and down is that the kind of thing that you're moaning about yeah I did I did have a moan up when during lockdown I'm not going to lie it was difficult uh, yeah we, we, we've got a running track installed at the training ground and and we ha- we weren't allowed to obviously come into the training ground at the same time as, as each other so we had to come in at different times if we wanted to run uh, it's a bit softer than running on the road so I tended to go in and, and do my running around the training ground and uh yeah, I did have a moan up because some of the sessions were ridiculous, really. <laughs> you're, you're my guy, man. Listen, I'm. You, listen, me and you are the same because Coops told me in it. Coops just said, "B, listen, Leeds is not for me." I, listen, I already know by the way you <laughs> man play and how you chase and win the ball, but I already know that it's not for me. But me and you, we're on the same hymn sheet. I would be. Aye, we could do the target man, change it up sometimes. If, if <laughs> no, you know, you're first at the end of no, the no, it's too much. It's too much because y'all lot have to win the ball back within three seconds. It's too much, man. I, I watch, I enjoy watching you, but you just know when you're like, nah, man, I can't play that sort of style. So I'll just watch yeah. from afar and appreciate. No, nah, it's difficult, but it's it's it is enjoyable when things are going well. It's enjoyable, you know, but yeah, yeah. Uh, it is hard work. Well, we've seen your heat map actually, and and the amount that you move and the the distance you cover and the space across the pitch, and it's literally everywhere, isn't it? Yeah, but I think if you if you put that up for every player, they'll probably have the same kind of thing. I just uh, thanks, thanks, Drew, thanks. What thanks. about bio? What do you think bio's <laughs> well, heat maps? Like? Well, at the moment, my heat map's on yeah, the bench, so you get me. Yeah. So, so I'm cool with where my heat map is at the moment. I just I chill on the <laughs> bench right now. Yeah. <laughs> I, mind you, in previous seasons, I've uh, my heat map is stretched to the bench as well. You know, it's only within the I, last couple on, of seasons. Come on, after my own heart, we know that, bro. It's all a process. Yeah, come on, uh, yeah it's. Uh, I don't know. It's just all the positions that that he asked me to play. That I don't know. Put put that. Put just put myself about. Just run about. If it's all you can do, isn't it? So basically, like if in doubt, just run about. That's correct. Um, yeah, sometimes it covers for having a bad game if you, if you put yourself about. Uh, well, see, yeah, I've never ever done that. That's, 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 that's never been my goal to Stuart. It's never been yeah. to yeah, have a bad time. Goal score, you, can, you can score goals, I can't. <laughs> I know, I've seen you score. So, hey, we're going to touch on your goal score. No, we're going to touch on it. We're going to uh, touch on it. So, LW, let's hope. go into it. Let's go find out. Let's yeah. start talking. Let's find out about him. Right, we'll go to the beginning because some commentators have been calling you Leedsborn. And you're very much not Leedsborn, are you? No. Uh, yeah, I, I think it happened the first time and maybe the second and third time they've maybe done it till, oh. I don't know, just till uh, wind up the Leeds fans, I think. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I was born in, in uh, Northern Ireland, obviously. Uh, and they've somehow said that it was Leeds born. I'm, I'm very proud to play for Leeds and, and to live in Leeds. My kids are, are growing up in Leeds and, and go to school and that here. So I'm very proud, but I'm, I'm, I'm also very proud of, of where I'm from. And, um, yeah, it's the, the fans have, to be fair, they've taken me in as one of their own. Um, uh, and it's great. It's, 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 it's a nice feeling for me, but I'm, uh, I'm Northern Ireland. I'm, I'm proud. You were originally, so you've had a career as a tradesman as well before you were a professional footballer. Tell us about that and about the the switch to football. I wouldn't go as far as saying a, a, a tradesman. I was I was there. I was just there to, to get a few quid for the weekends. Um, yeah, I was playing. I was playing obviously Irish league at the time, and and I was working uh, full time as well. So. Uh, yeah, as I say, I was. What I was, was the trade? Was, Tell us, man. What, what, what was the trade? What was the trade? Was what was you doing? To, I was trying to learn joinery, but if I'm being honest, I, I didn't have any interest in learning. Trying to learn as, what? As said, Sorry, well, you said wow. I, I Join- don't what joinery. Joinery. I'm gonna nod like I know what joinery is and that. So yeah, yeah. wow, wow, wow. These, wow. Guys, these guys, these guys with silver spoons and that. They don't, they don't, hmm. they don't understand. Hmm. 
<laughs> but I'm still in the hood now, brother, which means silver spoons, bro. <laughs> Bio's like, I get that no. kind of thing free. What is that? Yeah, what? Your mom yeah. just said, let's move on swiftly from joinery, <laughs> boinery. Let's move on swiftly from it. <laughs> Basically, Joinery. we'll say I was, I was, I was grafting. I was just, I was just there, as I say, to pick up a few, a few quid for the weekends, and um, then I was playing Irish league football. Uh, and yeah, I, I played two seasons in the Irish league and, and got my move to, to Brentford. Uh, I think it, it coming from from there and and doing that line of work, uh, it makes me appreciate things more now that that I have uh, because I've come from that from that side of things and. Uh, you know, I've 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 grew up all my life uh, till I was twenty one. I didn't move across to Brentford until I was twenty one, so it was quite late in in going across. Uh, I say across, I mean across the water. Uh, it's a term that we would use back home, and <laughs> and uh, yeah, I never looked back since. Uh, a great first club to go to, by the way. It's uh, probably I wouldn't be where I am now only for for that club. So you're talking about the Crusaders, and I've got a list here of everything that, that you won there. So. In your first year at the Crusaders, you received six prizes at the annual Player of the Year award ceremony. Um, you were chosen as both the Northern Ireland Football Writers Association Player of the Year and Young Player of the Year as well for 2010-2011 season. Um, so it was quite a successful time, really, for you. My first, my first season at, in, in the Irish League was great. Uh, as I say, I, I was sort of, I was just a new kid on the block and. And I come in till a till a team there that uh, were challenging sort of for for trophies, and I done really well in my first season, uh, and I won I won them awards. At, uh, I don't I don't know if it's ever been done before the young player and the and the senior player at the same time, and and uh, that actually got me my first international call up, which you know was a bit strange because I was still playing Irish league, and uh, yeah, then my second season I didn't really have a good second season at Crusaders to be honest. I was a bit, I had a few injuries and uh, teams were were clocking on to how I sort of played. I was a flying winger back then, so I was I had a bit about me. Uh, okay. But yeah, second season I didn't have as good a season, and uh, you know a few clubs were interested in, in bringing me across to England, and and uh, nothing really. I, I was happy. I was I was at home with my friends and, and family. Um, you know, I was happy just working and, and, and playing football in the Irish League, getting decent decent money for, for the standard I was playing at. And if nothing happened, I was that was it. I was I was happy just to stay at home and be with my mates and go out after a game and and stuff like that. Uh, I love the idea yeah, that then, now you've got to the Premier League, it's almost like an inconvenience. You're like, I was having a great know, time over there in Northern Ireland. I know, Ireland. he's talking about <laughs> silver spoons, is he? Look at him, he's like, yeah. <laughs> Well, no, no, I could have just stayed in the Irish League and chilled with the Mandem and uh, oh, the yeah. Prem. Friendhood and oh, Leeds, gosh. Premier League. And... Uh, the, prem, the Prem was a million miles away at, at that stage. Even I didn't really know what to expect, really, when you know when Brentford offered me a contract. And I didn't know what I was getting myself into. Uh, it was always a dream for me to play professional football, of course. But at 21, I just, I just thought, like, you know, if it doesn't happen now, it's it's fine. I'm 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 cool with that kind of thing. So, what was the toughest thing? So, you moved at 21 to Brentford. So, what was the yeah. biggest obstacles that you occurred going on 21 from playing in the Irish and then going to to Brentford? What was it? Did your did your mentality change, or was it still? Because you seem like a very much you just take things in your stride. Did your mentality change where you was like, yeah. all right, look, you know what, I got a knuckle down, or what? What was the biggest change for you? Yeah, well, it was a huge change for me, obviously, because I'd come from from you know working and training two nights a week uh, till going into a full time establishment. Uh, when I moved, when I moved, I just moved over. I flew over on the on the Sunday night or or whatever it was, and I began training on on the Monday. Uh, was straight into the hotel and and stayed in the hotel for a while. So everything was just. I moved into London, obviously, which was. A lot different from from anywhere, I, uh, you know, where, where I grew up. Yeah. Uh, everything was fast moving. Everything was a hundred mile an hour, and and uh, you know, it took me a while. I, I always say I mo- I actually moved at a good age because I was twenty one, so I knew you know I, I could live by myself. I could do things by myself. Whereas if I was a young kid coming over at that, you know, at fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, maybe I wouldn't be where I am today. Maybe things would have been different. I I could be playing. Champions League 
who knows? But I I could also be be back home in Northern Ireland, and uh, so I always think that I moved at a good age. But everything I'm not going to lie, like the first uh, few months till a year was difficult. Uh, I was away from from my family. Uh, I was trying to fly home as often as I could. I wasn't really settled, um, and it was it, it was difficult. But I went into a great club. We had a lot of good people at at Brentford at that time. Uh, a good group of players. Brentford's a really, really good club, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, at that time, the management, uh, the people within the club, a real family, family oriented club. And they really made me feel at, at home. And um, yeah, we had a, group, a great group of, uh, group of players there. And I'm sure you guys know that, you know, Jonathan Douglas, uh, Sam Saunders, Kev O'Connor, people like that who took me he took me in, especially you like Sons. He was from Sons Ireland. Is, Sons is a knockaway. <laughs> yeah. nah, you, nah, nah, Sons is good for you. Nah, Sons, it was, was yeah. Beanie there as well when you was there? Was Marcus Bean there as well? Beanie wasn't there, no. He, he wasn't there whenever I moved uh, Whenever I moved over. I think he maybe left the year before that. Okay. Um, so I had, had Sons and, and, and Doogie and Kev O'Connor, uh, players like that who experienced pros who, who took, took me under, under their wing. wing. Yeah, especially guys. Doogie, you know what? At Christmas time and that, Doogie, you know, had me with him and um, would never have made sure, he would always have made sure I wasn't on my own. So, uh, you know, it can be different when different clubs you go to, you know, everything's not the same as that. And, yeah. and for me, that really helped me settle in at, at that time. And uh, yeah, it was just then, obviously going from, from part-time to full-time training, I was picking up, I was getting... Injury, not injuries, but it was I was sore in places that I didn't know was was possible to be sore in, you know, because I wasn't used to, to the full time football. And uh, yeah. no, it was great. It was a, it was it was good, um, and, a, and a great first club for me to go to. So you joined there April two thousand and twelve when they were in League One. So were you in the stadium for the game against Doncaster two thousand and thirteen when they just pipped you? Yeah, I was. I wasn't in the squad that day. As I say, the first. I think that was my first. Yeah, it was my first year there, and and um, I had played a few games, but it was more. I, I wasn't in the squad that day, but I was there at the game, and wow, uh, never ex- never experienced anything like that. It was incredible. Uh, we were so close to obviously to going up, and and then it just everything changed with the kick of the cross, the width of a crossbar. Uh, and looking back on it now, probably a blessing in disguise for for Brentford. I don't think at that time we were quite ready to go up, and then obviously we went on the next year. And, and hey, tell me what the like, Stu, tell me what the changing was like after the game. Like just because I remember seeing that, and of course you know when you're outside looking and you watch games and you're like, wait, yeah, my man hit the bar, they went down the other end, I think it was Coppins, went down the other end and scored. You're thinking, yeah. oh my days. And as players, you can empathise thinking, oh my days. That would, What was the changing room like? It was, it was obviously, it was one of disbelief, really. Uh, thinking back, it's, it's hard to remember, but thinking back, you know, players had experienced, like the players had named there, the experienced lads, like the, to see them just totally gobsmacked and just flat it was it was sad really uh yeah you know it was my first first year in professional football and and it was an incredible experience for me uh but yeah Uwe Rosler like seeing him as well he had put so much into it that season and and um uh, you know staff player not just the players but the staff as well had put so much into it and it was just to see them all like that it was uh you know it wasn't it wasn't a nice place to be and I think everybody was, was was thinking about maybe hitting hitting Vegas on the Monday morning or something. I don't know if we yeah, if we got yeah, promoted yeah. and yeah 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 uh, yeah it didn't happen. But disappointing. Uh, but as I say, looking back on it now, it could have been a blessing in disguise, really. But you did eventually when when you got to grips with with how they play in League One and you started getting your game time. You played part quite a big part in the season when they did get promoted. Yeah. So that must have felt really special. What was that experience like? Yeah, it was great. Uh, great experience for me. Obviously, I think that I think I was on loan at Northampton that earlier on in that season, and uh, Uwe Rosler he got the he moved to Wigan then, and, and Mark Warburton took over, and uh, you know Warbs called me straight back from loan. Uh, I was out on loan obviously at the time and, and playing and, and getting game time, and I had done quite well at Northampton, even though we were struggling at the bottom of the league. 
and yeah, I, I come back and I started to play more and more that season. And we had a great, we had a very, very good team that season. Uh, and yet yeah, the experience promotion was was unbelievable. And you could tell then the Brentford were a club on the up, uh, and and were going places. And it was a great place to be. And and uh, as I say, looking back now, the first that happened in the first year was was a blessing in disguise because. You know the, the group of players that we had the following year and the mentality that we had was was great and uh, yeah it was it was it was nice obviously to get promotion in the end just to see all the hard work and that pay off for everyone around the club you know for the owner the owner put a lot of work into it Matthew Benham and and people like that it was great. So how um, long afterwards? So you got promoted with Brentford and then did you play a year in the yeah. champ with Brentford before Leeds came knocking? Is that how it worked? Yeah, I think I think I played. I think I've missed a year there somewhere because I think I was at Brentford for four years. See me and dates and yeah, I'm the same. Signed for Leeds in 2015, uh, didn't you? I'm I'm gonna yeah, I'm gonna so, try and patch your memory back up together, Stuart. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I'm so, the same. We we played a year in the championship and and we got to the playoff semi final. I think that that next year uh, in the championship and and Middlesbrough beat us. <laughs> you played champ. Leeds come in. So how did that come about? Yeah. And did you know much about Leeds? I mean, when how did it come about? And was it let me see the question, was it an easy decision to leave Brentford, as you said, in the sense where yeah, I think, you know Brentford felt it, like home? Yeah, I don't think it was it wasn't really an easy decision to leave Brentford because it was a club that had given me so much. Uh and I have so much respect for the club. But it was just there was a few changes with, within the club. There was players. We had a group of players, and and the group was starting to break up. And I just felt it was the right time for me uh, to to possibly make a move. And you know, when a club like Leeds, everybody says it when when Leeds, every single player says it when when Leeds come calling, it's a no brainer kind of thing. But uh, yeah, they they come in and and said they were interested. And obviously, Uwe Rossler was was Leeds manager at the time, and he wanted to sign me. So. I wanted to, to get back involved with him uh, because, uh, you know, how he treated me when I was at Brentford, uh, you know, the, the type of coach that he was. Don't get me wrong, like, at Brentford, Uwe was, at times, was hard work because of just, he was just so uh, driven and, and at times you were walking on eggshells around him because he was, you know, days he could be angry and, and stuff like that. But I sort of enjoyed that and I wanted to experience that again and I thought that was the right move for me to, to go to Leeds and... You know, when when I signed for Leeds, I thought, wow, this is great. Uh, what a club, huge club, huge fan base, everything. Because the town where I'm from back home in, in Cookstown, you know, people talk about the big clubs, the Liverpools, the Man Uniteds. But the the town where I'm from is actually quite a big Leeds, uh, Leeds United supporters club from there. They're probably bigger than Liverpool and Man United. Oh, so I've always known, uh, you know, how big Leeds, Leeds were and, and how much it meant to to the fans, uh, you know, it's a one one club city. How much football means to to the people of the city, and I thought, wow, this is huge. This is this is great for me. And uh, coming into the club, looking back on it now, the club was a mess. Really, whenever I signed, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so much has happened since then. Uh, you know, Massimo Cellino was 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 the owner then, and I got on I got on well with him. I'm not going to tell any lies and say that it didn't I, I got on very well with them but just the changes from the end is incredible since and Andrea come has come into the club it's it's been it's been mad really uh only now looking back on it do you realize but yeah uh, <laughs> when I got when I, when I come to the club I was you know you, you know what it's like yeah, you, you do interviews and you say this is a big club a special group and everything but looking back on it now it was just it was a mess really Tell us about um, that because because we had Liam on and we were talking about like how chaotic it was. Like, what yeah. what examples can you give us of, of the sort of chaos that you were going into? Well, it was just I think it was even the year before I come. It was a lot worse than than it mm. believe it or not had started to improve by the time I I arrived. I think the year before that they had the players who refused to play and and stuff like that. Uh, but whenever whenever I come, it was just Massimo was in charge and. He only gave Uve seven games at the start of the season, and and he was gone then. And and you know Steve Evans come in, and it just was it just we were just sort of 
it was just all about staying in the league. And and when I was in, and I was thinking like this club's going places, or you know they have a lot of ambition. We're going to try and achieve the playoffs, and but that quickly changed, and it was just more about staying in the league. Uh, when you know when when I come, and it was just difficult. Uh, yeah, we were the fa- the fans have always have always been good with us. Uh, you know they stick by us through thick and thin. But at that time, you know there was uh, there was only. 16, 17,000. Uh, I know that's quite a lot, obviously, in, in, in supporters, but Ellen Road holds 35, 30, 37,000. And, and uh, yeah, you could tell that there was obviously uh, a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes and the fans weren't happy and, and stuff like that. So to look back now and, and see the change and the progress that the club has went on is, is, is incredible, really. All right, so you know you signed and it was Rosler that was a, a part of it, you know, and he had seven games yeah. and he's gone and then Evans comes in and you being a new player, was there ever a point where you're thinking, raw, oh, boy, I'm starting again, I'm the new player and I, he was a big reason why I came, even though Leeds is Leeds. Yeah. What was your mindset then with then, oh, raw, oh, and now a, a, a new manager's come in, I'm, I'm not one of his players. It, you know, where was your mind at when Steve Evans come in? Well, I was obviously gutted because I had a, a good relationship with Uwe. Uh, I didn't know Steve Evans when he came in. Um, so it it all happened so quick. Like Uwe was just gone at one morning. He was he was gone at, as soon as we arrived in the training. He came in to say that he was that he had been sacked and that he was gone. And Steve Evans was in the training ground thirty minutes later. God. So it was just it was all chaotic. Wow. It, was, it was mad. It, I honestly, think it's so uh, so much, isn't it, to expect a group of players to just be fine with that? To kind of go, all right, say goodbye yeah, to yeah. one, so, welcome the other, and and then almost have to reset and change everything that you've been learning. Yeah, so it was chaotic at that time, uh, and he just he just come in the training ground, and I always, no matter what manager I have, I'll always I'll always respect him. Um, and yeah, it was a it was a huge it was a completely different culture change from from Uve as well. The yeah, training Steve Evans is no joke, different. man. He's no joke. He's no joke. Yeah, he's no joke. He's, <laughs> yeah, no he's joke. an angry guy at times, isn't he? he can, he's an he angry be, uh, hey, He's no joke. Like you, <laughs> and this is what yeah, the worst thing is. What and you you touched on it, LW. Like what people don't understand is, yo, it's different characters, isn't it? So Rossler, I've never yeah. worked under Rossler. I heard Rossler was no joke. What did was Miles Weston at um, Brentford when you signed? Uh yeah, Miles was the first season I was there. He, I think Miles was there. Yeah, yeah. yeah so he's told me some stories about Rossler as well, and he's yeah. not one of my managers as well. He he likes to work really hard. I'm not really a mad man there. That you get. <laughs> <laughs> so every so, manager, it feels yeah, like you, you have to is it works you really hard. No wonder you moan a lot. <laughs> yeah, bro. Yeah, yeah you've what you've had some proper yeah. managers. We're gonna touch on that. But what I was talking yeah. about is it's a yeah. hard thing to be able to just swing like different culture, different mentalities and that players instantaneously have to try and get on board. It's not easy. What well, outside people do not understand that. Yes, yeah, of course it's not easy. As I say, it's a complete culture change as well. Uh, and as I say, I'm not, I'm not, I wouldn't come on here and, and start talking bad about anybody. I have respect for every manager that I've had, but uh, we, yeah, it was just, it was, it was a difficult, a difficult time and uh <laughs> You know, I was playing. I was playing. I was playing regularly there. You know, I played quite a lot that first season. I think forty four, f- roughly around forty games in the league that season. So, it was really my first season that I that I played uh, quite a bit, uh, the majority of the games. So, I suppose you know when 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 managers change, uh, you've just got to get on with it, haven't you? Uh, but even then, we we sort of thought, you know. With the owner we had, this manager could be gone next week. So we were never really settled. I tell you what's yeah, interesting. So uh, the, the amount of managers that, that that you were under there. So Uwe Rosler, Steve Evans, who we've spoken about, Gary Monk then came in, Thomas Christensen, Paul Heckenbottom, eventually Marcelo Bielsa. I know I know you're you're kind of saying, look, I've got respect for all these managers there. That must be quite hard. Like, what were the relationships like with those guys as well? We'll obviously get to Marcelo in more detail yeah. than the others. Yeah, it was, it was, I think at the end of, at the end of that uh, Steve Evans season, we had just qualified for, for the Euros with Northern Ireland. 
So Gary Monk took over. Uh, I was away at the Euros and didn't really get a pre-season. Uh, didn't get no pre-season really. I was because I was just playing playing the games. I, uh, you know, Gary called me and said you can have an extra week or two off and and come back. So I'd come back sort of just before the start of the season and. By you'll know uh, yourself like when you don't have a, a pre-season it's, it doesn't stand you in good stead really for this going into the season uh, and that was that, that that season under Gary Monk I was a bit disappointed because Gary was a really good guy and, and I have a, a lot of time for him uh, treated me really really well and tried to play me as much as he could and, and but I just knew myself that I wasn't having the influence that I should have on, on the team Uh we had a really good season that that year, to be fair, and, and missed out in the playoffs. Should have, should have got in the playoffs, easy, uh, you know, easily, and we didn't. We fell away at the end, and uh, you know, obviously he leaves, and, and Thomas Christensen comes in. I have a really good pre-season then, and I'm I'm doing really well. I've scored a few goals, and um, come the first game of the season, I'm not in the squad. We're away to Bolton, I think, and I'm not in the squad, and, and I'm starting to think, you know. Is this place right for me now? You start to question yourself because yeah, there yeah, wasn't much more that I could have done in pre-season. Uh, you know, I was fit, I had no injuries, I, I was played all the pre-season games, doing really well, scoring a few goals, and then come the first game of the season, I'm not in the squad. Uh, and I wasn't really one for, you know, if, if a manager didn't play me, I, I've, I've never been one for going and knocking on his door and asking, you know, what's going on here? Why am I not playing? You should be playing. So how do you I, deal I, I, with that? That day, that day at Bolton, uh, he made me travel, you know, an hour and a half down the road from Leeds. And, you know, my, my wife is from Northern Ireland as well. My kids, um, you know, were only were only young at the time. And I just thought that I had more respect from, from that he could have respected me a bit more and that made me... I'm not... Yeah. Nobody's above that, but... No, no, I, talk, to I totally get what you're saying. I wasn't going yeah. to be in the squad. You know, my wife was here by herself, no family. Mm. Uh, you know, I think I had two kids at the time and... And uh, again, dates and me just totally Love loses that. me. But, I think I had two uh, at the time. <laughs> I waited. I waited until after the game. I waited until after the game, and and uh, yeah, I had a few words and just and just said like, just show me some respect. Don't trail me up here to to tell to have me walk in the changing room and be told then that yeah, I'm yeah. not in the squad. I was yeah. genuinely walking in the changing room thinking I'm starting here. Yeah. And I walked in. There wasn't an eighteen. Wow, with it like. So uh does it make you yeah, lose a um, little bit of respect for them with with without getting you to dig him yeah, out but yeah it does Thomas, man Thomas. listen let me, look yeah. I'll answer this yeah let me tell you this <laughs> it does because I uh, and, and listen Stuart speaking he, he look, respect goes both ways so you know what I'm saying yeah. if you're doing everything right and like you said nobody feels like or they shouldn't feel like they're above the club above the teammates yeah. and it's never about the players but listen if you feel like it's touch and go for you to start and then you're not in the squad and yeah. you haven't got an inkling and you only get told an hour or an hour and a half maybe before before game day it's I beg show yeah. me a little bit of respect to pull me beside and say look I'm going with so and so and let me bitch outside you yeah. know what I'm saying and that's for me that's where it is so when they don't do it right yeah. You do. I, I don't care in any walk of life. It's treat treat those how you want to be treated, and that's and that's for me yeah. where I totally get it from Stuart. It's just yeah, man. If you're not respecting me, of course I'm going to be losing respect from actions. So I just had to jump in there because that's yeah. happened to me a few times. You see me? Like I've I've never I've never been one for causing controversy. Uh, you know, if I'm not playing, I'm not going to be a bad apple in the group. I'll just do what I have to do and, and get on with it uh, and to be fair from from then onwards it was it was alright uh, you know it was, I was I'm not saying because that argument it was yes you did you time, scared him don't say it man. what did you say to him what did you say to him you put it on him uh, <laughs> you think you're slick <laughs> no it didn't, it didn't but, you know I became, a, I became because I was starting to question whether I should you know should I be starting to look at other options I, did I want to settle my because uh, you know my little girl was starting to go to school. Uh, you know, did I really want to settle here if if I'm going to have to get up and move house again? And you know, these were questions that needed answered at the time. And and you know, I, I spoke to him then, and, and he just said, "Yeah, you know, you're a big part of the group. I want you here." And 
and then that was all I needed to know. Uh, and I just got my head down and continued to work and didn't really play as much, uh, you know, as as I as I felt I should have. Um, yeah, and then again another change of manager, uh, Paul Hackingbottom come in and and he he started to play me then and. But we were sort of just seeing out the end of the season then. Uh, you know, all hope of the playoffs were gone. And uh, we knew we sort of knew that, you know, come the end of the season, <laughs> we're going to have another new manager. So it was another That's clean crazy, slate. And, and then, <laughs> yeah. And then obviously, uh, Marcelo comes in then and, and, and things change. Well, this is the bit really that probably a lot of, if there's Leeds fans listening, that they'll be dying to get to. Um, and I've actually sat on this for a while because. I would have wanted to go straight in with Marcelo Bielsa, but we have to do all the background. I have a little obsession with him, Stuart. I'm I'm, I'm not too proud to admit yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I just I just think he's wonderful. Um, I've read a lot about him, and uh, when Liam came on, we were having these conversations about him too, um, and about the way that he's embedded himself in in Leeds, really, and in the whole makeup of Leeds. And I, I love that about him. So when he came in, what yeah. were your first impressions of this man? How much did you know about his past as well? Yeah, I think everybody knew who he was. Um, you know, when when the whispers had come around that that it was possibly that it was possible that Leeds were getting Marcelo Bielsa in, I, I don't think anybody really believed it. Uh, and that's full credit to, to you know to the guys at Andrea, Victor, and Angus, and that at the club who got him. But when he first came in, uh, my wife was. She was pregnant. She was she was almost due, and I found it really difficult because not really difficult, but it, it was complete again another complete culture change. Uh, you know, we didn't have a we didn't go away in pre season. We we uh, we stayed at a hotel beside the training ground. So when he came in, uh, the owner had had come in as well and and just said, "Look, sacrifice everything for these next ten months or whatever it be, and and see where it takes us." My wife, obviously, going back, she was happily pregnant, and and we have no family over here. You know, everybody's back back home in Northern Ireland, and we got our training schedule through, and it was about, uh, you know, we come into training, and then after training, we we on a Monday, in between the double sessions, we were having to go to the hotel, sleep in the hotel. This was before we got the training beds at the at the are the beds at the training ground, so we were having to go there and come back for the second session, then stay in the hotel on the Monday what? night. What? Coming, Come in the <laughs> come in the training on the Tuesday, and uh, you know do a double session, and then go home on the on the Tuesday evening, back in on Wednesday, and repeat what we done on the Monday. So I sort of asked, could I go home in between sessions, and you know, and, and oh, spend time with my wife and help her because we already had, uh, you know, had the two kids, and 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 uh, yeah, it was sort of a swift no. Uh, really, so that was so that was, no. was like. Whoa sacrifice I didn't directly go to him but but through the staff and that it was about and that just for me now I'm thankful for that you know it, it oh, totally cool. changed my mindset yeah, and yeah. helped my mentality but at that time I found it quite difficult because it wasn't nice for my wife being here by herself and dealing with the kids and, and being heavily pregnant or two in a couple of weeks and I just thought that I could go home in between the sessions or whatever and, and help and and um yeah, it was, but at that time, it, it, you know, the, the words of sacrifice in my head from the owner just kept ringing in my head and think, and I just kept thinking, well, like this will all be worth it in the end. And it's made me a stronger and better person, really. Uh, yeah, so it's been, it's been tough work from, from day one, but enjoyable, really. All right, so when Coop's come on, we're talking about, and I've never, well, actually, that's a lie. I've had a manager that I didn't understand in that. So how did you find the not understanding him having the interpreter how did you how did you find that you know what i'm saying that whole bit because it's it's mind-boggling you know for me where yeah. i'm like he's got his and how did you find it yeah it, it was difficult of course i think through the translator was it was broken a broken english as well because the translator obviously wasn't english so it was difficult to, to grasp at the start um i'm not saying i'm i'm can speak speak fluent Spanish now, but you sort of because we've been working together for for almost three years, you sort of get used to it. But at the start, it was uh, it was difficult. But it's weird because he, he just has a such a big presence that you just you just buy into what he's doing. 
Yeah. It's it it I don't know, it's just weird. It's, I can't really put my finger on it. You're but, a you know, another manager coming in who Yeah, but another manager coming in who maybe wasn't as well respected in the game, you know, players maybe would have thought, I'm not doing that. Yeah, but he yeah. just from he walked into the changing room, he knew everybody's everybody's name and if he didn't call you by your name he knew your squad number you know and, and the detail that he already knew when he walked in and, and that just you know it just sat with everybody everybody just sat up and thought wow this is real this is you know this club's going places now and we just bought in to, to what he wanted to do and, and uh, when he started talking about the changes that needed to be made uh, you know the, the weight transfer, transformations and stuff like that Again, that was another difficult hurdle to overcome because I always thought that I was, you know, quite... My game was based a lot around fitness and my running power and, and stuff like that. And I always thought I was in, in good shape to play a, a football match. But when I look back now, I've, I, like me myself, I've had to lose like four, four and a half, five kilos, wow. uh, you know, whenever he come in to get down to the body fat that he wants everybody at, the, you know, the weights and everything was just changed. The club just went in a whole new direction. You know, the nutritional side of things, everything just was flipped upside down. And and uh, I'm so thankful, honestly, that that, that, come, that the club brought him in because I don't know where we'd have been if, if, if they hadn't have. Genuinely, if, when something changes so drastically like that, do you look at that and think, this man might might add time to my career? You know, that he's got me in such a shape and a way of training that, you know, I yeah. could carry on for longer than I ever thought I could. Without doubt. Uh, you know, it's very rare now that, that, that I'll miss a training session. Uh, you know, I've played quite a lot of games in, in recent seasons. Touch wood, that, that continues. But for me now, I've, I've got the mindset where the more I train the better I feel kind of, kind of way. And I know that's strange for people who haven't been used to that before. At the start, I didn't think that either. But for me, I think, he, if, well, I'm approaching 30 now. I, I hope I can still continue for a few more years. But uh, yeah, I think he's, de he's definitely made me see a different side to things, you know, my nutritional side. Like it wouldn't have cost me a thought till, you know, if, if to go and get a fish and chip or to have a beer mm -hmm. or something like that. But now it's, because I have to make weight target the next morning, it's it's completely changed my mindset. Bio, I think I need Marcelo in my life because at the moment uh, I'm still on that vibe very look, much. <laughs> let me tell you something. I'm not even going to lie, but I'm hearing you talk and I'm thinking, <laughs> oh, hell no. I swear to God. Look, you know, them, you know what? <laughs> you see them three chocolate bars you had last night? I seen on your Snapchat them three chocolate bars. Yeah. Bio. yeah. It was two. It was two. It was yeah, two, yeah. man. It was two. It was two. It was two, you know. But he's like double size of a human being anyway, so he's allowed. No, they were small. They were, they were actually small. On the, on the no, but you, you but you saw me do the, you saw me do the what bike before I had it, no big man. You saw it, no, innit? Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I basically I just yeah, balanced yeah, myself sure. out. But you know what I love? <laughs> you know what I love, and it's Coops has, has said the same thing, and even forget when you say you can't put it into words, we actually get the energy that you're saying about what um, my man. What's his name again? Your manager. Marcelo, but yeah, I'll yeah, yeah, Marcelo, my bad. Yeah, how what Marcelo's done for you in the sense where it's it's such a you you've so much bought into it, and listen, I get you're in the Premier League, and of course, it always when things happen at the end of it, you're like, yeah, you know what? But you and Coop speak the exactly same way about it in the sense where beforehand yeah. you lot thought you was good, and you thought you was doing everything yeah. right until Marcelo's come in, and he's just show that you can elevate yourself to what you lot are doing now and I get it and that's what I love from the way you're just talking about it and I've been managers my manager now I, I get you know what I'm saying I think he's he's different and we click and I talk highly yeah. about him because I, I get him on a human level so I want to do more for you know on the pitch and I get yeah. that from you and it's such a it's a unique especially in the game we are in that it's rare that you kind of get that connection with a manager and you and Coop speak the exactly same and it's it's nice to hear man yeah. um I tell you what I do want to ask actually which um I find quite interesting before we kind of skipping ahead a few things here but um I did the game so it was the Leicester game um where you guys played against them and it was 3-1 in the end and um yeah. I, I I said this on on radio when I went and did the radio show on Monday that it was probably 
the most entertaining game I think I've watched live in a in a really long time. Like I haven't I haven't kind of experienced that sort of like the excitement of it all, the amount the, the both teams, like the fitness levels of, of both yeah. teams. And there was a part post match where um we have the the ability, obviously, we've we're blessed with the fact that we have stats and all that sort of stuff on Sky. So we can draw on these. And and me and the stats guy were talking during the game and, and after all the changes were made, um it was an 11 of championship players, basically, that had been championship players. Yeah. And I'd asked Marcelo Bielsa about it afterwards and he hadn't he hadn't noticed it, obviously, because why would he? Because he's creating this team and, yeah. and moving forward and all that sort of stuff. But the way that you talk about the training that you guys have had to do and the amount that you've developed, it's he's, he's made you, I don't think this is unfair to say, has, has he made you into... Premier League players, you know, because you see teams and, and you've obviously made a few changes and Rafinha has been amazing, by the way. But is it yeah. what he's done that has prepared you so well for the Premier League? With, without doubt, yeah. Uh, obviously, he's, he's improved us all as as, as players. Uh, it's hard to, to, to explain some of, the thing, some of the things that we do, but he's just... You know, he's, he's not a manager. <laughs> the game, obviously... You have to have quality as well, of course you do, but we can't get away from the fact that three years ago, the core of this team was a was a mid-table championship team. Of course it was, and it's there in, in, in black and white. You can see, you know, that the changes that he was, has made till the majority, till all of us, in fact. But it's just the way he makes you see the game as well. Uh, you know, again, we thought we worked hard. We didn't. We didn't work hard until he come in. You know, the way that he he. he he makes you, uh, you know, off the ball. Just for example, like react. Uh, you know, he wants you to, to, you react. He's not bothered if you lose the ball or if you do a mistake. It's all about how you react, and and try and win the ball back or or try and, uh, you know, cover for your teammate or, or something. Uh, and every everything that we do is, uh, you know, we just try to, you know, a lot of things we do in training is like stop, sprint, stop, sprint to try and get our, our reaction times better. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, of course, the, the quality that he's he's just give us a confidence and a belief that that you know we aren't bad you know, we aren't bad players. Uh, but again, it's something I never ever thought. I always dreamt I would play in the Premier League, but never thought I would I would ever get the chance. And and uh, even last season when when we were winning in the Championship, I never thought I'm going to start. Uh, you know, in the Premier League, and and he just gives a confidence and, and belief that, that they're good enough and yeah he's, he's I have no words to, to, to thank him for the job he's done on me personally alright so I, I want to ask this in it um, so the first game of the season after pre-season you're going into Liverpool listen you're my you're my guy now I ain't going to lie but I'm glad Liverpool beat you I'm just throwing that out there but because I'm a Liverpool <laughs> support you know what I'm saying but what did he say in the sense of going into this season. So, you know, Leeds have got so much plaudits and not just because you man run, yeah. like just because you play fearless football, but it's still fearless with a structure of, you know, you're setting up with a game plan. So it's not like you man are just out there running. You lot, you can see you lot set up with a game plan. So of course, everybody's like, you know what, Leeds are fearless. They're not sitting behind, they're attacking. So what did he say? Going into the start of this Premier League season, like what did Marcelo go to you lot and be, what was his, what was his message going forward? Well, he he has his philosophy and how he wants to play, and he's never shied away from that. Uh, he's never changed that. Uh, you know, we're we're very man for man, uh, as as you see when when we play, and and he just he's give us that belief that we can go anywhere and and get a result. Uh, maybe at times we I don't know, if, you know, people have said that we shouldn't be so naive and and stuff like that, but we just try and go toe to toe with anyone and and. That has always been the message from him. He's he's always he's he's never changed. He's he's coached for so long now, and and he never will change. And and we're we were a team coming off from the championship, and we we were used to winning quite quite a lot. Obviously, uh, week in week out, and there, and we just sort of carried that belief on. And I think the performance at Anfield in the first game gave us a lot of again gave us extra belief that we could go to these places and and match and and match teams. Uh, you know, and and that was the going downfield was sort of a by ball for us, really. Uh, you know, our first game back in the top flight against the champions, and 
and we done we done quite well. Uh, and then obviously we had two home games. I think after that, or two, yeah, we had two two games. We had Fulham and Sheffield United where we managed to pick up two wins, and and, we, and that gave us huge belief that we were you know were able to to sort of compete at this level. I know it was it was still early on in the season, but. Uh, yeah, then we get a draw at, at, at home to Man City, and and we're thinking, you know, this is this we is great. This. You know, we're yeah. able to play like this, and 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 this this won't change. We can't change from this because we've showed that, you know, we can go to Liverpool and play like that. We can we can play like that against City, and we can we can beat teams who, with all due respect, are probably going to be in around, uh, you know, our position in the table. Uh, you know, in Sheffield United and and Fulham, and two teams. Sorry, with respect, that we want to be finishing above, above them. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it just it just continued on, and of course we're going to have games where where it doesn't look good on the eye, and it's not pretty, and we're open and we're cut open. Like we go to Old Trafford and and get beat six, and that hurt that day. Of course it did because nobody wants to get beat by anybody, but to get beat by Man United as well was was hugely d- disappointing because it meant so much to to the club. But uh, again, we're we're not going to change from the from who we are. Uh, you know, we've done this for three years now, and and we'll continue to do it. What I wanted to do actually was um, take you back to just narrowly missing out on promotion, how that felt, and then the feeling of actually getting it. So first of all, even though, sorry, it's probably not a nice memory to to go back to, but the playoff games and 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 the, just the missing out just at the last minute. Yes, yeah, hugely disappointing. Uh, it just felt like we touched on the Brantford thing earlier. It just felt like that all over again. Only it felt like. I was a bigger part of it because obviously the first season that, that happened, I didn't play much and I wasn't as involved as I was with Leeds that year. And yeah, it, we've only ourselves to blame, really. We've we probably bottled it uh, towards the end of the season because we were in a position where we should have got promoted uh, and the pressure probably got to us. Uh, it, I th- you know, I think it was us and Sheffield United that were sort of going for that second place and they were always playing ahead of us, which, and they kept winning. And then the pressure would just f- flip, and and it would come on to us. And in the end, it probably got got the better of us. And we went into that to that semi final against Derby, and and obviously the the magnitude of that was huge because obviously of what had happened earlier on in the season with the whole Spygate thing, and and we won at their place. We won one nil, I think it was, and it was a comfortable one nil. And we come to Lars, we're one 0 up and, and going into half time and we concede a soft goal and the whole momentum just the whole thing tie just swung. Uh and we just couldn't get going in the second half and we end up we lose the game and but after it, it was yeah, it was horrendous. It was it wasn't a nice place to be. Everybody there was t- tears everywhere and it was just more of disbelief as as to how this happened because it, it shouldn't have happened. Uh, and fair play to Derby, they, they, they you know they come and they done a job on us, and uh, it was a hard one to take as well because of what had went on earlier on in the season. Uh, yeah, after it, I just wanted to get away from 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 Leeds. I wanted to get on holiday with my family and and uh, with my kids and that, and just chill out and uh, just get away from it all. And you know, thankfully, I was able to do that. You banged two goals, right? Two, yeah. So, so tell the people in it. So it's because it's that's bittersweet in it because you're out there, big stage, scored yeah. first leg, second leg. Was that what you did it both scored in both games? No, in the in the, in the second leg, uh, I scored to put us one 0 up, and then we go two one down, three one down, and then I scored to make a three two, which obviously brings a tie equal. Uh, and Ellen Road just erupts the place. The, Honestly, the roof almost came off it. It was the atmosphere was incredible, and and then we lose it. So it was bittersweet because the next day I was getting, you know, I was getting plaudits for yeah, yeah, you played, played and, well, yeah, you that happened. And yeah. I found it difficult. I, I found it, and again, it might be hard for people to to believe what I'm saying, but I find it difficult to accept that because I seen the hurt that it had on my teammates, the hurt it had on me, the hurt we represent so many people at this football club and we felt like we'd failed. We felt like we'd let them down. And it was just, I didn't want the plaudits. I didn't want people saying, oh, you done all right, you scored two. And, 
it's just a shame that, that we couldn't have won. And and for me, I find that difficult to accept that because it, it's not the type of guy who I am. I've if I had been dropped for that and, and won the game, I've you know I'd have been a lot happier, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, that was that was that was hard to to accept. I had to try and stay off social media and stuff for a while. Uh, just so to try and switch off completely from it because I knew it would it would have taken over my life and, and you know I don't know it's it's not a nice place social media at the best of times and never mind after something like that yeah I, I can totally understand that like social media can be one of those things Liam said the same thing as well that you know sometimes you just have to kind of have a bit of reality check and social media isn't the place for that and and you need to work yeah. through those feelings but obviously the hurt that you experienced to be able to put that into some sort of a positive way and use it the second season or the season after, sorry, to then come up and and to have that spike after the lockdown as well, where it just felt like I don't know, it, it was like it was like you'd learnt from those mistakes and then you'd done it all right the next time and then you came up and what were those? It's it's weird, isn't it? It must have been kind of muted celebrations in a way because you couldn't do it with the fans. Yeah, it was it was. <laughs> strange situation to be in to be honest but touching back on obviously going again from the from the season that, that was disappointing easy to say now but again maybe another blessing in disguise because it it, it gives the group a better mentality and and we started off the season we started really well had our dip as uh as everybody knows around uh christmas and, and january time and went on a good run then and then lockdown hits and and you start questioning you know Nobody knew, obviously, in the whole world what was going to happen. We didn't know if we were going to play, if we weren't going to play, and we just had to be had to be ready for, for, uh, you know, for starting back if it was to start back. And you know, other teams were having time off. Speaking to other players, they were having time off, and and we were having these running sessions to do, and we were thinking, like, should we not be having a break here? There was word coming through that. You know the, the the PFA were saying take your break now because come the summer you mightn't have a break. We could be straight back into another season. So as a group of players, uh, you know we sort of just took it upon ourselves and said like we can either sack this off or we can, you know, work hard and and be one step ahead of everybody else when when we come back. And you know I'm glad now that we did. It was it would have been easy to sit at home and and not do nothing. Uh, but again, it helped. It helped getting out of the house and and going and doing something. Uh, and yeah, we just had it in our head. I know speaking to a few of the other boys, they, they said the same that, you know, when we were out running, we just thought this is what gets us promoted. And we start back and we lose away to Cardiff. We, I think we're, we're away to Cardiff on the Sunday. And f at that time, Fulham were probably our nearest challengers and they were at home to Brantford. So we were hoping, you know, that Brantford win. Mm. So we're, we're ready to fly to, to, fly to Cardiff. Uh, I remember we, we, we take off and it's nil nil and whenever we land, Brentford have won two nil and and we're we're thinking this is a huge chance for us to stretch our lead on Fulham uh, tomorrow and then we get beat by Cardiff <laughs> two nil and yeah, uh again all just the whole pressure then changes again and people are thinking, you know, this lockdown's changing everything. The uh leads are gonna mess it up again and, and uh we had to pick ourselves up then and ironically in the end then it's Brentford who've become our biggest challengers and they kept winning mm. which obviously put a lot of pressure on us so we had to keep winning and uh, yeah thankfully in the end it, it all worked out uh, and in the end we, we won it quite comfortably didn't we? Mm. Interesting as well so I want to find out about the celebrations and about what they were like because um you might not enjoy this, but the other piece of feedback that we've been given, um, again, this is attributed to Liam Cooper. When we stopped recording the podcast we did with him, um, he said you were the worst drinker in the history of Leeds United. Is that true? He said you're a shambles, big man. He said you, you, you said you lightweight, bro. Can't believe that. No, I'm 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 probably the worst, as in I don't know when to stop, but <laughs> yeah, not lightweight. Yeah. Uh, I'm just a normal guy who who loves a pint at the weekend, and <laughs> you know if the party continues, well. Why not? Why not have, <laughs> have a long, you know what I mean? Uh, not by heart. Yeah, the the celebrations were, uh, yeah, they were they were good, they were brilliant, they were unbelievable. Uh, you know, we thinking back, we obviously not being able to celebrate it with fans was a disappointment. Um, we we all would would have loved that, but we had to make best of of what was there and. 
the night it got the night we got promoted, we West Brom obviously they lost. So we were at the stadium watching the game and it was surreal. You know, we we went to the game not really thinking that that anything would happen. Um Huddersfield go one 0 up and the cra- you know, there's the words coming in that people are starting to gather outside Allen Road and, and we're thinking again, oblivious to what was really going to happen, not knowing how you know, what it we knew what it meant to people, but yeah, yeah. It just took off to a different level. West Brom equalise and, and things are starting to quiet down and then Huddersfield go two one up and all of a sudden we were looking out the out the window uh, at the front of the stadium and people are just arriving. You know, there's fireworks going off, there's smoke bombs, everything. Um, it's giving me goosebumps now to actually thinking back to it because it was an incredible experience and uh, yeah, after after the game we've all come. I think there's one a picture, I'm sure you've maybe seen it, we're all standing at the window and the fans are all down below and he just wanted to be in among it. And uh yeah, that party continued right into the into the middle of the night next morning and we have to go to train and we're thinking, you know, the manager might give us the next day off because we had a game two days later, we were away to Derby and yeah. but we were sort of thinking, come on. Gaffer, give us a day off. You know, we've just got promoted, but we had to go in and run. So, uh, <laughs> With it still in your system. It round. We were in at 11 o'clock or something, pelting it around the running track, but <laughs> some of us had just rocked in at, you know, five or six o'clock in the morning and, and, and we're there <laughs> running around the running track. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, then we had to travel to Derby that day and, there was a few sore heads on the bus. Uh, I would have loved, I'm not going to lie, I'd have loved just to continue on the party and <laughs> got steaming in the hotel. It would have been great, wouldn't it? But <laughs> obviously, you've got, to, you've got, to, got to prepare for a game. So I actually play. I, I thought he would have made it. He did make a few changes, but I was one of the players who had to play. And <laughs> our running stats on the Sunday yeah. for the Derby game was the highest of the season, which is incredible to think because... It should. It, there's no way it should, it should. I I swear somebody tampered with the with the GPS because <laughs> it must have made you think a little bit about your preparation for game and actually maybe a party before a yeah, game. Yeah, I was going to the game thinking I need to I need to be drinking two nights before the game. <laughs> 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 but, uh, um, no, t- touching back to the celebrations that night, you know when Marcelo and that come to the stadium, we didn't think that that he would have come because none of us really have that re- kind of relationship with him, but. He come to the stadium and we were uh, in the boxes, just about looking down onto the pitch, and you could see him walking across the pitch, and it was just, it was just magic to, uh, you know, for him to come, and we were shouting down at him, and he was waving up, and and it was just a magical moment. And then whenever he come up, I'm sure on, on the documentary you see when he comes in, you know, he's hugging everybody, and just to see him experience that as well, because. They put in so much work, him and his staff. It's incredible the detail they go into. It's frightening. And to see the joy for them, uh, you know, everybody just come together at one time was was incredible. But then the next day, it was just as if nothing happened. It was just he was back to work and, and that was it. All right, so, you know, you started off as like a flying winger and that and your heat maps all over the place and that and you just play everywhere. What What's your favourite position to play? I knew you were going to ask this. Um, <laughs> everybody asked me, and I don't. I genuinely don't have an answer. If you'd have said to me at the start of the season, I would have said fullback because my game had that was where I played the majority of of last season when when I did play. And midfield was never really, you know, I'm, I'm happy to go in there and try and do a job to the best of my ability. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm I'm not a, I'm, I'm by no means a midfielder, but the more the season has gone on. Both, sorry, last season and, and and this season, and the more I've played in the position, the more comfortable I'm getting. Uh, you know, I'm not going to be one who's going to go and and absolutely run games from midfield, but I don't have, I, don't, I genuinely don't have an answer. You know, if if, if he names me in, as a number eight on on a Saturday, I'm happy. If he names me as a number as a right back or a left back, you know, I'm I'm equally as happy. That's the way to get in every team, isn't it? I know. <laughs> like, I don't care. I'll you do it. Just do everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll go and go. 
Um, can we ask you about someday, your international you career? Someday, can we ask you about your international career? Because um, Euro 2016, um, I was out there just, I was working, but I was pretty much out there as like a, a yeah. covert fan. And um, I just went to loads of games in the fan parks and your fans, I just remembered them just being amazing. Like they were the best yeah. set of fans, so much fun. Didn't matter if you won or lost the game, they were just on it all the time. They were just brilliant. What was that experience like? And, and and talk us through like the camp and just the feeling of being involved and how far you got. Yeah, it was it was huge. It was a dream come true. Till it is to represent your country, but to represent your country at a major tournament is is incredible. Uh, again, something I never thought I would get the chance to do. Uh, and we qualify we qualify that that year, and and obviously we we go to the Euros, but it's just the whole build up till it. You know, it's it's for Northern Ireland to get there was a, was a huge success uh, story, and we go there and but because of because of what had went on before, you know the the, the terrorist attacks in in France and stuff, the security around the whole thing was was mad. It was like we were staying we were staying in a place just outside Lyon, about an hour outside Lyon in in the countryside, and there was nobody allowed in. We weren't allowed out. If we wanted to go out. We had to take. There had to be security come with us. They be, we wanted to go to the shop, mm. and they basically they took us to a supermarket. They, they basically cleared the whole supermarket out, oh, just so wow. that we could go in and get what we needed, and come out. Honestly, it was it was incredible, and and um, the whole yeah the whole security around it just made it. You know, at night time we we had like we weren't allowed family in or anything. It was it was strange as well. Uh, and yeah, but the whole that first game, I just remember the fans that first game, and all my mates had obviously flew out to it, and mm. and you know they were sent me videos from the fan parks, everything, and I just wanted to be in among the fans as well. You know, it was <laughs> it would have been great, but I probably met I remember them. The, <laughs> probably, yeah, yeah. But the first game, I would, I actually didn't start the first game because I had got married at the start of June, so I had left training camp. To go and get married, which I don't think Michael O'Neill was was too pleased about. That's uh, amazing. So you were like, sorry, I'm yeah, yeah. So I, we we were in we were in Austria in training camp, and we were playing Slovakia then in a friendly right before the Euros. And I didn't play. I flew home to get married the day before my wedding, and got married. We were playing Slovakia the next day, and I didn't play in it. I was at home, uh, and then I flew out to meet them. Uh, to go to France that next morning, and that was the only game that since I've come in the international setup that that it didn't start. Uh, you know, Michael, he couldn't really because the boys had played well against Slovakia, so it was my own, yeah. it was my own fault really that it that it didn't get starting in the first game. I come on at half time and then I, I play all the other games, but yeah, the whole experience was just incredible and and. Yeah, uh, what a summer! Some good parties along the way again. Yeah, that must that must, must have just been the most amazing summer for you. There, there, there's a story as well that, that me and Bayer were talking about earlier on that we wanted to ask you about. Um, so losing five one to Norway last year, Erling Haaland um, is in the team. Post match, he wants to swap shirts with you. Is that right? Yeah. God, tell me, tell me yeah, the story. Just, uh, <laughs> It's not really a story. It was just like after the game, we'd just been beaten five one. He had played like a superstar he is and ripped us apart. And then after the game, he just I went to shake hands with him and he just like said to me, "Can I yeah, swap shirts?" And and I sort of what I think if you watch the clip, I sort of like just smile and kind of walk on. And then he's like shouted at me and I've come back and he was like, "Yeah, we do it now." And he just swapped shirts and then like just whispered into my ear like just talk like come close to me and was just like marching on together wow. and uh he's like a uh a follow leads and that 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 was it really uh looking back now i've i've been smiling and laughing on on camera when we've just been hammered five one probably wasn't the smartest of things but yeah look looking back on it i will do in, in years to come and and he'll be banging in goals and and he'll be the best best player in the world and for me to have a shirt is, is great. It's something that you know I'll be able to tell my kids when I'm older as well that he asked me for mine. All right, a couple it's questions. I, I, I just want a couple questions. First, did you get stick for smiling? Did they did people come at you saying, "Oh, why are you smiling?" Did did you get stick for that crap? No, they, they no, they didn't. Nobody nobody said anything. But uh, 
I'm sure there's people maybe thought it. You know, ah. I probably would have thought it if I'd have been watching. Yeah, if I'd have been a fan watching, thinking. All right. So what <laughs> did you think, honestly? So what did you think? So when, like you said, was you just thinking he was bantering you, like when he was like, "Listen, we'll change shirts and that." Like, and did you know that he had an affiliation yeah, with Leeds? Well, I knew he had an affiliation with Leeds, obviously, with his dad and that. And uh, so I knew there was a connection there. Uh, but I didn't think he would have stopped me and, and asked me for my shirt. Uh, I used to, because you're big time as well, I, man. You're a big time player, cuz. That's I why. I don't, I, I honestly don't really like swapping shirts with people. And, and, and t- I don't like asking anybody. Uh, so it was nice that, that he wanted he wanted mine. And uh, yeah, it's, it's something I'll. I'll I'll treasure really. Did you know the connection with his dad and 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 your club and and did you know that that's probably like why he followed Leeds and why there was an interest there? Yeah, of course. I, I knew I knew that and obviously uh, coming into the game, you know, you have Leeds fans uh, saying, "Do oh, have a word with <laughs> with them and see if he'll sign for Leeds?" Just, and, you know, just general like, dad yeah, and yeah. really. And uh, obviously, I knew that I knew the connection that that, that was there, but. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's nice. I think it's amazing. I think it's one of those stories that the, the further he progresses in his career, like you say, like he'll be a Ballon d'Or winner probably one day and uh, yeah. and you're going to say to your kids, see that shirt? That's his. He actually asked for my shirt and I didn't want to give it to him either. I just love that you were like... I that's that's what, what makes shirt. me laugh because you're like, <laughs> nah, great. man, I, I like to keep my shirts out here. And the man's like, nah, man, we'll do it here. You're like, oh. Yeah, it's not so much that I like to keep my shirts. It's just I don't like asking anybody because yeah. I just... I don't know. I just I don't want to be a bit beggy. You don't want to be like, come on, come on, no man, come on now, man. Yeah. Hey, bub, if we get you in the FA Cup before I retire, bub, I'm asking for your shirt. Best believe. You know what I'm saying? No, I'm. You're you're somebody I will. I'll ask for. I'll ask My for your brother. <laughs> he's only saying that because he's on here. <laughs> We don't tend to do too well in the FA Cup, so... Uh, <laughs> you can have it. That's the only way I'm going to get you in. That's the only time I'm going to play against yeah. your team. <laughs> um, yeah, you never know. We have to let you go soon, so, we, so we're going to finish it up, but um, it feels right that we should we should end really on, on your fan base because, um, like me and Bai were saying, any time we, we do anything on Leeds... It's probably the most uh, loyal fan base. I think one of the most loyal fan bases out there, really. Um, and they're so buzzing that you're coming on. So... You've you've done this season. We can almost say that that you're safe. You're going to stay up in the Premier League, which I imagine for you guys is, was so important. Because sorry, sorry, I don't want to you know touch wood and all that sort of yeah. stuff. Don't want to tempt fate, but it's looking all right, isn't it? Um, you must be at the back of your mind thinking, look, we've got to stay up just for one to stay in the Premier League, but also we've got to stay up because we need the fans back in. We need them to experience this with us. Yeah, yeah. Look. <sighs> Coming into this season, we again nobody knew when fans would be back. Uh, you know, we were all asking them questions as well, and we want them to be part of it. They have suffered for so long. Of course, they have. It's been well documented how long Leeds have been out of the Premier League, and and you know they need to get back. And and for the fans now to miss out and and you know not have the chance to see us in the Premier League, it was hugely important, or it is hugely important that that we try and maintain and, and stay in the league this season. Uh, you know we've we've done all right so far. Uh, you know there's there's games. I'm just, I think back to the likes of the Man City game at home. You know imagine Ellen Road had it been full that night and, uh, you know and, and drawn with, with City. Uh, you know the place would have been would have been rocking and, uh, it's, yeah, it's hugely important that, that we stay in the league and and so that they can experience that. Uh, you know they've suffered for a long time and they've stuck to bias through thick and thin, and. Uh, you know, we're very, us as players, we're very, very fortunate that we play for a club like this because, as I said before, we represent a lot of people here. We know how big a club is and how much it means to people. You know, the, the passion of the fans, you know, you see it day in, day out. Uh, you know, whether you're in, in the city, uh, you know, when people walking past you, whether it's even delivery guys coming to your house, you know, to the postman or, or something like that, and to see what it means to them and to see what it meant to them when we got promoted. You know, fans, you know, Older older fans who've experienced a lot more than, than what the younger ones have, to see, you know, the joy on their faces and, and what it really meant to them is it's just it was incredible. Um you know, it's it's looking when I watch the documentary and I see the fans, the passion from the fans, it's it's just it's hard to see how football can mean so much to people. You know, I never really thought football meant so much to so many people. Until you see something like that, or you see the 
the guy in the shop that you go in to buy something mm. behind the counter and he's telling you how he's full of leads and, and you never you don't know all this mm. and and um yeah it's it's incredible and, and hopefully you know fans can return sooner rather than later uh when it when it's safe to do so. No, that's mad. Listen, I I remember we I think I was at Northampton and we went to Leeds on the last game of the season and we had to win to stay up. And Leeds were probably yeah. going for something. And it was a packed Ellen Road. And when I mean we could not hear each other talk, that's how loud it was. We got beat 3 0, got relegated. Yeah. So it was, but, you know, to be able to have that in the Prem, like, and, and listen, the way you play, I, to be fair, I, I get why you might have gone above and beyond to stay up just so they can see you play because it's yeah. such a powerful weapon. Yeah, I, I look back to sorry, just looking back to games last year where, you know, during when there was no fans, uh, you know, we we drew one each at, at home to Luton one night, and I'm just thinking, you know, if fans had been in the stadium that night, you know, they could have pulled us over the line and yeah. and stuff like that. But when I think back to the Barnsley game that effectively clinched their promotion, we won one nil that night. If they had been in that night, they would have. I don't yeah. know. It, it, <laughs> it would have went bad because. Yeah. We were ter- we were terrible that day, and it was just uh, there was so much anxiety about it. it. Was just you know because we knew we were so close, and uh, we knew if we win this game, and, and Barnsley were fighting for their lives, and and you know they play played us off the park that night. To be fair to them, and you know fans had it been in that night, it it, it definitely would have been a, a, a different kind of experience. But uh, look, our fans are well well known throughout throughout the world, and uh, you know it's. As I said before, we're fortunate to represent this club. Well, look, we've got a date now. Hopefully, if everything goes to plan, May 17th, fans allowed back in the stadium. And uh, in a way, I suppose I suppose the only light from this is that you suddenly realise, don't you, how much it means to have them there. So I don't think, I don't think going forward now, I know, I know me doing my job, I don't think you'll ever underestimate the power of them or, or also take them for granted and what they bring to games because stadiums just feel like ghost towns without them it's, it's really it's really hard isn't it to just kind of crack on and be like yeah fine football football it's yeah. a different game yeah it's of course it's 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 not for football's nothing without the fans really uh you know they bring we bring so much enjoyment as footballers to them and, and they bring so much enjoyment to us as well and yeah, yeah, yeah. you know for you as well by you know, being in the championship I'm sure you would have loved to experience the fans this year as well and uh, you know I think your season's finished is it by the time the fans yeah, are possibly I mean, allowed back in yeah when they come back it was listen we've sat there and saying how unfortunately it is it's took Wickham's first time to be in a championship and for them not yeah. to experience and the only game like I said the only game they experienced we played Coventry and we had them last season so it wasn't even like they came yeah. to see a team that we hadn't played so yeah it's real unfortunate but like we said we're still going to be swinging so hopefully we can try and do what we can and make a miracle that we can kind of have Wickham in well, yeah, the champ next the season so yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> Right, Stuart, um, we know that you're a busy man, so we'll let you go. Thank you. That was honestly really, really fun. So really enjoyed that. Thank Thanks for spending much. some time Thanks for with having us. Me. All right, brother. You're very, Thank very you. welcome. Cheers, well done, brother. Okay, uh, love that. Another Leeds guest, another brilliant podcast. What a nice guy, Vio. Yeah, he was cool, man. I liked his energy as well, man. Cool, calm, relaxed. Nah, man, it was good, man. He was intriguing. Didn't moan at all, did he? Nah, man, he was good, man. He got home with us. We got it on Smash. <laughs> <laughs> okay, brilliant. Uh, looking forward to next week. So we're going to do our um, Super 6 fixtures now for round 40. Download the Super 6 app, create an account and play for free by predicting the scores of six chosen matches to be in with a chance of winning £250,000 this week. Another reminder as well, I invite your mates, they can join Super 6. And if any of your friends hit the jackpot, you'll win £25,000. Quite good, isn't it, Bio? Nice. Cash money, man. Cash money. Okay, so we're going to go on to our six predictions for this week. So the first fixture, Shepherd United against Southampton in the Premier League. Um, I'm really sorry to Blades fans because I absolutely love you. Um, but I think at some point, Southampton are going to have to bite back. And I think it's going to be a 2-0 away win for the Saints. You know what? Nah, I told you I don't really like agreeing with you. So I'm going to go against you. I'm going to say the Blades are going to win 1-0. Preston against Bournemouth. I'm going to go for a 1-0 away win for Bournemouth. Uh, I will go 2-1 Bournemouth. 
The third fixture, Norwich against Luton. For me, I'm going to go for a Norwich win because they're flying high. 2-0. Sorry, Luton. Yeah, we just played them, so I agree with you. I think a Norwich win, but I'm going to say 3-1 Norwich. Oh, okay. Next one. Swansea Borough. Um, I never like to go against the Borough. Um, I'm going to say, even though Swansea are high, I'm going to say 1-1. I'm going to say a draw for this one. Um, like I said, I've, I've said this a few times once, a Jack or is a Jack, so I ain't going to go against Swansea. And I think Swansea's going to win this 1-0. Tight game, 1-0. Okay. Do you know what? I want to change it. Oh, no, it's fine. I'm going to leave it. Okay, Brentford, Rotherham. Uh, sorry about this, Rotherham. I'm going to say Brentford 3-0 win. I'm going to say also a Brentford win, but I think Rotherham will score, so I'm going to say 3-1 Brentford. Okay, final one, number six, is Reading against Sheffield Wednesday. Even though Wednesday got their new manager in, I'm going to say for this one, 1-0 one Reading. And you know what? I'm going to agree with you. Normally, I don't like to agree with you, but I also think Reading's going to win. I think it'll be a tight game because of Darren Moore, so I'll say 1-0 Reading. All right, people, that's it for this week. Thank you for listening, and a big shout-out to Stuart Dallas for joining us. Remember, people, we're on Twitter and Instagram. You can follow us at Super6. And if you're enjoying it, which we really hope that you are, hit the like and subscribe and then the podcast automatically downloads for you each week. And if you feel like it, give us five stars and a little review, but please keep it kind. If you're going to do a review, just do a good review, all right? And then say like, I don't know, Laura gets all the predictions right, Bio doesn't really that often. You know, what's going on there? Don't let her sway you, you know what I'm saying? Look, show me love, you know what I'm saying? I need the love. Show me the love, five star review. Come on, people. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us. See you next time. See you. Take care, people. Peace. <laughs>